This episode of The Curbsiders is supported by ACP's Internal Medicine Meeting 2019, the premier live clinical and practice-related education meeting for internists and subspecialists. Guys, uh, will you be there this year? I think Paul is. It's With a, a ten. song in my heart and a smile on my face. <laughs> and a banjo on your... <laughs> <laughs> The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from policy, cash like more hospital, and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much we are responsible for this. Always do your own homework and listen to your opinions. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. And Paul, Stuart is not here tonight, but we had a great guest, and I think he's going to be really jealous that he didn't get to talk to Dr. Finucan. Sure, I certainly hope so. Paul, before I get too far into things, why don't you tell them what it is that we do on this show? Happy to, as always, Matt. We are the internal medicine podcast that uses expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And then as per usual, we will talk to our guests up front about what makes them them, what they do to decompress, what things make them a human being. And as always, you could skip ahead if there is no joy in your heart. Um, and if you choose to do so, just look at the timestamps in the show notes and they'll guide you to the actual bulk of the interview. On this episode, we're going to be talking with Dr. Finucan about urinary tract infections. And I'm saying that with air quotes, which will be thoroughly explained uh, as we go through the episode. But we are going to get into does acute uncomplicated cystitis ever actually need treatment? What do you do with the delirious uh, older adult patient with a geriatric syndrome that may or may not include fever? Um, do, do all those patients really have a, quote, urinary tract uh, infection, unquote? And also, who really does benefit from antibiotics? We, we try to get our best answers and go through the evidence about all of this And I think you're really going to love this episode with our guest, Dr. Thomas Finucan. He is an emeritus professor of medicine at John Hopkins. He graduated from Harvard College and Emory University School of Medicine, then did a residency in primary care internal medicine at George Washington University. After five years at West Virginia University, he joined Hopkins and stayed for 31 years. He's worked in Dominica, Mexico and Uganda served seven years on the American Bar Association's Commission on Legal Problems of the Elderly and chaired the Ethics Committee at John Hopkins Bayview for 12 years. A clinician educator in Hopkins' bustling geriatrics division, Dr. Finucan has called attention to drug overtreatment of diabetes, dementia, stomach ache, UTI, delirium, insomnia, and more, and to the overuse of feeding tubes and CPAP. He has received a variety of teaching awards. Much of his time with learners has focused on three main topics. First is the care of people with chronic disease and disability, and in particular, the widespread and deeply held desire not to be dead. Second is the medical ignorome, which we will explain on the show, and how to manage this as a learner. And third is the pervasive and sometimes illegal promotional activity of industry. He and his wife, Dr. Robin McKenzie, who is also senior faculty at Hopkins, have five children, and he is currently living in Boston. And this is where Stuart, while listening to this, is slowly dying inside because we're not going to do any kind of pun at all. We're just going to let this one just slide right past. (laughs) Thank you, Paul. Well, Tom, I I wanted to start off by asking you, uh, we've already read your bio, so the audience has a bit of an idea about you, but how would you describe yourself in a one-liner and maybe include something about yourself outside the world of medicine? Uh, six months ago, I retired from Hopkins and moved up to Boston because we have four daughters and uh, and a son, and the four daughters all live in Boston. Three of them uh, are married and have children, and they all live within about 200 meters of each other in Brookline Village. So now I live in Brookline with my wife as well, and uh, am experimenting around with the idea of some part-time work. But for now, I'm emeritus at Hopkins and not not doing medical work. Okay. Well, from 
from what I know about you, I think uh, if you if you find the energy or the time, I, I feel like you should be, uh, even if it's just uh, on our podcast, I feel like you should be doing some teaching. And uh, also to say that I, I lived in uh, Brookline at Coolidge Corner for four years of medical school, and it was fantastic. So you're in a good neighborhood. So, yep. So, Tom, a question I always like to ask is a book. I think we started out asking a book every physician should read, but it doesn't even have to be that specific. Just a book that you would recommend. Um, and if it's medical, great. But if not, that's OK, too. In general, I don't read medicine, medicine books uh, other than to, textbook kind of books. Mm hmm. But I would say my favorite book that, uh, but you have to be not reading it while you're falling asleep is Absalom, Absalom by Faulkner. Oh, yeah. You, I don't think you can read any Faulkner while falling asleep, but I'm not sure I've read that one. What is that one about? Oh, it's about uh, two half brothers who go to the Civil War together. It's a, it's a Faulknerian plot and it's not easily summarized, but it's about. <laughs> That's a fair two, answer. As soon as I asked, I felt guilty. <laughs> good, good. Two brothers, a very punitive father, Thomas Sutpen. Uh, they go to the war, they go to war together. There's a woman involved who happens to be sister and half sister to the two of them, and it's about race to a great extent, and then about the the old South. That's a stellar recommendation. It right up my alley. Thank you. I'll have to get that toot sweet. <laughs> I. Just to go to bed with coffee if you're going to read it in bed. <laughs> I I would like to ask you about, uh, so you've done, you had a great career, you've retired, which I consider getting to retirement is, is a success in my book. But I, I'd like to know about a time in your career where maybe you struggled or you had something that at least initially you saw as a failure and what, what did you learn from that? Well, a struggle would be for 14 months we had four teenage daughters and they shared a single bathroom Oof. with their brother as well, who was the youngest of them all. <laughs> and uh, failures, you know, Zen teaches us that if we control our expectations, we cannot be disappointed. And I, I the only, I, I've made mistakes that harmed patients, and I consider that failure. What is... What is some great advice you've received throughout your career, whether it was while you were a learner or later in your career as a teacher? I would say a very important piece of advice that I received when we were getting ready to finish residency and move to West Virginia, where we were for five, subsequently for five years, we were thinking about, we were talking, we knew nothing about real estate and we were talking to a, a mentor from Emory and he said, whenever you move into a house, always behave as if you're going to live there for a very long time. So, and, and period. And then un, <laughs> implicit, in, impi implicit in that is don't, don't you know, take half steps because you might be leaving soon. If you run through the tape, sort of. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, I think, was a good, good advice. All right. Well, thank you for that. Now, before, before we get into talking about the main topic tonight, which is urinary tract infections, I did want to know, can you tell us what is meant by the medical ignorome? Well, the medical ignorome is sort of the medium that we move around in where things are just not known to us and we make up stories based on the things we do, do know about and see, but we are... Uh, and, and we're often pa uh, transmitting bad ideas. And I'll give you an example. I, I did, gave this, this was part of a course for the medical students for 20 or so years. But I would ask them, do you believe that steatorrhea is heralded by floating stools? And t to this day, they believe that. And I could I ask you guys, sure. steatorrhea, sign of point. I'll tell you, it that's what out. I was taught. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's out there. Like, and the, it was d completely disproven more than 20 years ago by a couple of a really wacky gastroenterologists. And the way they disproved it is they, <laughs> they gathered up a collection of floating stools and they put them one by one under a bell jar and increased the pressure and all the stools sank. And then they released the pressure and all the stools started floating again. So it's gas that makes stools float. 
not steatur- not not a high fat content. And it's in this is a little indelicate, but it's intuitively plausible because everybody has floating stools sometimes, and intermittent steatorrhea is actually unheard of practically for on a day to day rotation. Then these authors did some calculations with tools that they describe in excruciating detail where they analyzed the the actual floating stools. And the back of the envelope calculation for them was that if the stool was to float because of fat content, it would have to be the approximate consistency of butter. (laughs) And so on three different lines of evidence, they say it's wrong. Stop saying that. And now decades later, generations later, it's fully embedded in the knowledge that we all have. And, and things that uh, one that recently went away was you should only give if you're going to give blood, you may as well give two units. There's right. no reason to give one unit. And another one that's alive and da- dangerous is if you start a course of antibiotics, you should finish it so that you don't generate resistance. And that's really a foolish idea, but it's, it's just passed down in the ignorome. I love it. I I I uh I think we need to, everyone needs to start talking more about the ignorome and I we we had your friend on uh talking about things we do for no reason and he uh, uh Lenny, Lenny yeah. he told us he told us the we did go over the if you're going to give one one unit uh give two so he he he's our audience knows not to do that anymore and uh, well, good. <laughs> but that is still something I mean I, when I was in residency I I I literally had heard people say that and I'm glad that there's things we do for no reason. There's the work that you've done and there's the, the whole choosing wisely stuff in general, people trying to get, get rid of these practices. But there's a book that, uh, there's a book called Ending Medical Reversal by Adam Sifu and Vinay Prasad. And they, they talk about, they talk about these practices that are widely adopted. And then at some point a trial comes out or the evidence builds up enough to disprove these practices. And even after the practice has been disproven, it takes at least a decade before it's no longer widespread. And right. I, I think it's such an interesting and also dangerous thing about, about medicine. Uh, just to say, de-adoption is always slower than adoption. Like this, this glucose of 80 in the ICU, one right. paper put it on the map for years and paper after paper said no, and it's still around although it's dying a slow death finally. <laughs> I'm sorry, Paul, I interrupted you. No, it's, well, I was going to say nothing important, except I, I love the level of obsession in medicine in general. And like just the two people looking at stool under bell jars and just probably high-fiving when they realize it's the error. Like I just, I just, I love all of that. But I guess the question I had for you apropos of that, <laughs> which is a smooth transition, you're glad you're on the show. But I, I just, I, I get the sense that you're sort of, I guess the question I had is, are you someone who's always sort of challenged conventions? It seems like you don't take a whole lot at face value just based on what I've read from you and just our short time talking together. Has that always been part of your personality? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think so. But Alan Watts once said, you know, t- trying to define yourself is like trying to bite your own teeth. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't really have insight into what I'm, I'm like. <laughs> Sure. Okay. We'll have to we'll have to interview your wife on the next show. And <laughs> yeah. I'm She's sure great. she has some insight into that. Sure. <laughs> Before we get to the main learning event tonight, we do have a sponsor, and it is the ACP's annual meeting, annual internal medicine meeting 2019, which is taking place in Philadelphia at the beautiful Pennsylvania Convention Center. Paul and Stuart, I believe you guys will be there. Yeah, that's right, Matt. We will certainly be there, and we are super excited to be sponsored by ACP. It's Internal Medicine Meeting 2019. (laughs) (laughs) So, Matt, I know this is an exceptional educational experience that is led by world-class faculty, but I guess I had some specific questions. So, what kind of educational activities might be available to me at this Internal Medicine Meeting 2019? That's a great question, Paul. You are going to be able to attend over 170 scientific and practice-related sessions, and you will be able to get hands-on learning because there are interactive workshops there. Oh, spectacular. And Stuart, it seems like you're familiar with this event. I'm wondering, are there any social events that perhaps I should be aware of? 
Yeah, there's going to be a ton of social events, special events, receptions, and networking events. You got to check in when you uh, check in at the the ACP's uh, check in desk. <laughs> <laughs> Great, helpful and specific. <laughs> so, Matt, who is this event for specifically? Well, well, Paul, I'm glad you asked. This this event is pretty much for anybody, whether you're a primary care internist, hospitalist, office-based internist, or a subspecialist. You're going to come away with a lot of practical knowledge that you can use. Uh, this is this is stuff from the cutting edge. So you're going to ma- be up to date if you're coming to this meeting. I don't know about you guys, but I really loved it last year, and I hope it's uh, just as good this year. And I'm I'm certain it will be. And as much. As I'm excited to learn, I have to wonder selfishly, Stuart, are there going to be CME credits available for this? Absolutely. There's going to be CME credits available. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, so Paul, you can join thousands of your colleagues in Philadelphia at the Pennsylvania Convention Center. The main meeting is from April 11th to 13th, 2019, and the pre-course is held from April 9th to 10th, 2019, also at the Pennsylvania Convention Center. And uh, we hope to see you all there. Yeah, can't wait to see you. And remember, ACP members get the lowest rates before January 31st. Learn what the ACP meeting has in store for you at annualmeeting.acponline.org or just Google ACP Internal Medicine Meeting 2019. Or Bing, or Bing. (laughs) Or Ask Jeeves, or (laughs) all the old favorites. All right, well, Paul, why don't we we go to the case? Uh, Would you like to do the honors, Paul? Sure, I'd love to. So this is, as per usual, uh, a case from Cashlack Memorial. We're going to be talking about Mrs. Stone. She is a 72-year-old female with type 2 diabetes uh, using insulin. She has high blood pressure that's reasonably well controlled. She has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction because everyone does. And she presents to the Cashlack Regional Ambulatory Practice. She's coming in because she's noticing a change in the odor of her urine, and she wants to know if this represents a urinary tract infection. So following standard operating procedure at Cashlack, the triage nurse sends urinalysis even prior to the patient's visit. The DIXA comes back and shows small leukocytesterase, negative nitrates, no blood, a specific gravity of 1.025. And because we work really fast, um, microscopy shows 0 to 2 RBCs, 20 to 30 white cells, few bacteria, and rare highline casts. So this is, I feel like, a fairly common discussion and presentation. Um, and I, I think before we even get started, maybe it might be worth sort of talking, talking about definitions first. So... Um, going through things like bacteria versus UTI versus dysbiosis, would you mind sort of breaking down how you conceptualize the varying presence of bacteria in urine? That, that is a very complex question. I think there's two, there's two levels of answer. The first is what we're doing with, uh, in clinical practice right now based on the results of lab cultures. And the, I think the most fatal f- flaw in that is if, if the culture is negative, we say the urine is sterile. But we, we know that the urinary tract is, uh, begins in Bowman's capsule and flows without interruption down to the urethra. There are no discrete anatomic barriers. There's occasional sphincters. There's peristalsis. There's uh, some wicked mucosal immunity. But on, on the whole, the, the, that's an open system right up to Bowman's capsule and 24/7 it's producing material that is nutritious for many many family of bacteria so if you're a self-respecting gram negative rod at the urethral orifice and here's a a little sanctuary a big sanctuary really that offers 24/7 all you can eat golden nutritious <laughs> plentiful uh, nutrition who is what what Back, what gram negative rod is not going to set up a residence there and we know now without any doubt and should have known earlier but for the ignorome that the urinary tract is not sterile never has been it's it's on the surface of the body and it's full of nutrition so i think when you say what do you think about bacteriuria in the urinary tract there there's a, there are two levels what what are we doing now with the policy that if there's anything we can't easily identify, we're going to ignore it. And then what's, what, what, what is the meaning of all these other bacteria? And I mean all these other bacteria that are there that we can't identify. And do they help us in some way understand the role of bacteria and 
the, the genesis of illness in the urinary tract. And in addition, as you may know, in addition to bacteria, there's a, a well-established urinary virome, also ubiquitous. So in my own mind, it's p possible that just as upper respiratory infections now are clearly seen as predominantly viral and still treated with antibiotics, it may, there's no reason that it may not turn out to be that the urinary tract infection is mainly a viral illness as well. Although they do, the symptoms do seem to respond to antibiotics, which is in favor of bacteria. So I think I successfully avoided answering your no, question. No, no, <laughs> that was a really helpful framework, actually. Okay, so to summarize, the techniques that we use currently are are identifying, you know, one usually one or maybe a couple types of bacteria that we grow and we count the colony forming units in the in the urine, but there's there's other ways to check the urine for the presence of bacteria or viruses and there's there's a whole microbiome that exists that we just ignore because we don't really know what to do with it yet. It's it's difficult to see and we don't know what to do with it both. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the stuff that we can see, the the big reason we're talking is because part of the big reason we're talking is because the stuff that we can see, uh we we're doing something with it but we don't know if it's right and we don't, you know, people have trouble telling when should I treat, when shouldn't I treat. So we're hoping that we can, that we can kind of shed some light on that tonight. Um, Good. With this woman, Miss Mrs. Stone that we have, now she has a change in the odor of her urine and, and then she has this urinalysis and dipstick that seems to have pyuria defined as white cells in the urine, usually greater than 10. She has 20 to 30 white cells in her urine. So I guess my, my question would be, is there, what would you ask her on the history or what would, what sort of exam findings, if any, are going to help you make your decision about whether or not this patient has any problem with her urinary tract? Well, let's assume that she's in the, actually for the, for the duration of the discussion, let's assume we're talking about reasonably healthy people with structurally and functionally normal urinary tracts who are not catheterized and aren't pregnant. So we'll say she has well-controlled diabetes and good functional status. She still drives a car, you know, lives independently. She's she's doing well. And not pregnant. And not pregnant, of course. Not pregnant, 75. <laughs> That's good. Well, I would say, first of all, I, I have never made a, a, any clinical decision based on the dipstick myself. And for me, also, pyuria is only useful for, uh, in my opinion, if it's absent, then you can say, well, unless this patient's markedly neutropenic, that's, there doesn't, whatever's going on, his bladder is not that upset about it. Mm -hmm. So for her, I would say, uh, it, it depends on how, what our relationship is, but let's say that we know each other a little bit. I would say Mrs. Uh, Smith, uh, Mrs. Stone, um, you know, w w the smell of your urine depends on a lot of things. Uh, did, did you notice this while you're sitting on the toilet? Does it remind you of anything you ate last night? Have you been uh, uh, restricting your volume intake to make the urine, at, which might make the urine con concentrated? And if you took a specimen, exactly how long did you uh, look at it before? Um, how long did you keep it before you smelled it? But regardless of that, there's no evidence that a bad smelling urine is associated with a disease that will be helped by antibiotics. Or stated differently, would you like to hold that urine specimen up to the light and you uh, improve its bouquet by taking an <laughs> antibiotics, which will disrupt your entire microbiome for months and maybe longer in order to achieve a, a sweet smelling urine. <laughs> and we would, I would just try to talk to her in a semi jocular way saying, come on now, you know, you know better than that. But in, but uh, in truth, it's a very common uh, reason in long-term care, exactly as you say, bef the nurses are, are authorized to send specimens when they sense a UTI, and then you're kind of stuck, especially if the urine comes back with a bunch of schmutz in it, and then when the culture is positive, then you're really 
up against the wall and you have just a lot of explaining to do. I think it's in a lot of ways, and I'm not, maybe this is just where I practice, but there's almost sort of this vague magical sense that with, with older patients in particular, um, the symptoms can be nebulous and that, that might be indicative of a urinary tract infection. Who knows? Um, as I guess for the, the big sense out there. So I guess my question for you, are there any particular symptoms that do raise your eyebrows or that you think are particularly important when you're taking a urinary history for a patient like this? Be before we, uh, and talk about that. I want to focus on something that you just said, which is that the term UTI has a lot of power. If you say, uh, I, this guy has, this, this patient has developed delirium and he has bacteriuria, that has a lot less oomph than saying he's delirious and he has a UTI. Right. If you say, you know, the, quali the uh, olfactory quality of her urine has diminished recently, and she has a UTI, <laughs> then, then what are you going to do, right? That, and there was a very interesting study done where a guy was in the lab of a hospital, and he looked at every uh, urine culture sent on a non-catheterized inpatient. This is roughly speaking. And among those who were positive, he sent half, a, a half a, among those who were positive, the physicians received the, the notification of a positive urine culture. In the other half, what they received was a short message that said, most positive urine cultures in non-catheterized hospital patients uh, are asymptomatic bacteriuria. If you would like to know the results of this culture, call the lab. Hmm. And a tiny minority of docs followed up by calling the lab. And antibiotic treatment fell dramatically from just that simple intervention. So it's if you call it other than a UTI, it helps. And UTI, just you pull it out of your pocket and everybody will give antibiotics. In truth, you know, in the era of the microbiome, the construct of an infection is falling on hard times. We don't really know. <laughs> we shouldn't, we should stop saying that and say, the question should be, is there evidence that this patient would benefit more than she would be harmed by a course of antibiotic treatment. So that, I think that the power of that phrase, it, we have to undermine that in some way and, and just start saying bacteriuria as much as we can. And as, as you know, I, I believe in using the, the bilateral, bimanual air quote sign every time you say <laughs> UTI. And I believe that authors ought to put qu quotes around UTI in their papers because we don't really know what we're talking about. I feel like there's a great like YouTube viral video or something, uh, somebody making fun of UTIs with air quotes in there. Maybe we'll, yeah. Maybe we'll get Stuart. Up. We'll, we'll give that a assignment to Stuart, Paul. I think he could uh, he could figure something out. Yeah, if he was here, he'd already be deep in a Google search, I'm sure. <laughs> but if you imagine talking to this patient, and let's say her adult daughter is is accompanying her, and and we start talking about a UTI, but instead of just saying it, all the docs in the room do the air quotes sign <laughs> whenever they say it, and then the mom and the the patient and the daughter will start to think, well, what. What are those guys doing? And then you would have an authorization to explain what, why we know there's bacteriuria in her urine because there always is. And there's not a shred of evidence that anything good would come of trying to make her urine smell better. So are there any questions or, or any symptoms that you even care about when you're talking to patients that, that might have a urinary tract infection? Could you please do the air quotes when you ask that question? A urinary tract <laughs> infection? Sorry, I forgot you could see me. <laughs> uh, first of all, the first cut is, is, are, is there a systemic illness and are they crumping right in front of you? And then don't bother about the urine, you know, prompt empiric antibiotics, culture her up and stop them when cultures come back negative. So you, you have to make a judgment. Is this patient so sick, irregardless of what the urine shows? Mm -hmm. And then a second question is, is there blood or any chance of blood? Because urinary tract bleeding in adults is, is a problem. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, there's no combination for, for me of nitrites and leukogesterase and just the right uh, spectrum of, of symptoms that says, okay, that identifies a patient where we are confident we can help her with antibiotic treatment more than we harm her. 
if you can find a case where that patient needs antibiotics based on evidence, then I would follow that pathway in my questioning. But it's extremely rare. Right. The the paper that you had written, the, the Requiem for a Heavyweight, it, I, I just noticed that it seems like when when patients do have symptoms, uh, it's it's hard to predict who is going to progress to a systemic infection. Like if they're if they're not already systemically ill from urinary tract symptoms, it's hard to to single out. As of right now, we don't really have ways of knowing who is going to spontaneously remit and who is going to get sick from that. And I think that's one of the big challenges. And then the other big challenge, which we've sort of been talking about, is there's all these things people, for whatever reason, love to get love to get treated for urinary tract infection. I'm using air quotes. And, <laughs> Appreciate it. And, and so any, any kind of symptoms, it's frequency, dysuria, and uh, suprapubic pain, all those things kind of get lumped in. And, and if all those people get, get a urinalysis sent, and then they get di- this diagnosis when, as you were mentioning, a pretty high percentage, and I don't know if you know offhand, but there's a pretty high percentage of patients, especially in nursing homes, who would have uh, um, pyuria or a positive urinalysis in some way, just just if we sent them on all these in- asymptomatic patients. The If you're living in long-term care and you're a woman, the chance of having pyuria on a day when you feel perfectly well is 25 to 50%, and in men, it's 15 to 40%. Mm-hmm. So it's a co- it's a if it's present when something else happens it's uh, there's a good chance that it's a coincidence mm-hmm. and that it's been there for a long time. Yeah. But if you if you go back to this question of le- leaving aside the woman who's concerned about the, the odor of her urine if you let's think about acute uncomplicated cystitis. So once again a pretty healthy woman a pretty normal urinary tract and she develops dysuria and, and a vague feeling of malaise. The data are pretty clear. Well, you know, in the Hooten paper in the New England Journal on reviewing acute uncomplicated cystitis, his first bulleted boxed point is that the main reason to give, the main benefit from uh, treating acute uncomplicated cystitis is the relief of symptoms. It rarely or rarely, rarely progresses to severe illness. For me, bi- there's a great biological plausibility that, there because for, uh, for human beings have been around 150,000 years and antibiotics have been around for 50 years. So, and now in under-resourced countries as well, uh, situations as well, uh, for over generations, over eons and around the world now, women have acute uncomplicated cystitis and that nothing bad happens when they don't access antibiotics. It's just implausible that something that m- we sometimes call honeymoon cystitis would somehow impair the reproductive fitness of the race. It's the the data are pretty good that you can get pyelonephritis after acute uncomplicated cystitis, but the rate is about the same if you get treated with antibiotics as without. There are there are um, more and more. There's a recent study which shows that a high percentage got pyelonephritis so badly that they had to be hospitalized. But it's it's an outlier, and it's highly implausible to me biologically that that's the case. If you look at the global burden of disease, pyelonephritis and death from renal, uh, you know, uh, urosepsis, those are not big, big challenges. And yet it's estimated that on the average, every woman in the world gets a UTI, a, a UTI gets acute uncomplicated cystitis more than once in her life. So if there was a great risk of progression, then we I, we would see a lot more sick women with uh, bacteremia and pyelonephritis, and we just don't see it. In fact, it, the fact that several large studies have randomized women to ibuprofen or to nothing, or have just had an arm that's not placebo, just you don't get treated, have been approved by IRBs around the world, or I shouldn't say around the world, in, in Europe and in the U.S., and there's there it's considered safe not to treat that in most places. And now there's kind of a, as usual, we're kind of hysterical in the United States, and we're, we're, we're as and the penalty we pay is why you know 
terrible levels of antibiotic resistance. One of the prices. It reminds me, it's my favorite quote about medicine is from Voltaire, which is, I know, like the most pretentious thing in the world. But he said, the, the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. And it kind of sounds like this is maybe another example of that. <laughs> Just another example of that. It's honeymoon cystitis, for heaven's sakes. It's not going to take you out of the lineup for reproduction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to I want to try to change the case slightly. Actually, I'd like to ask you, Tom, if you what what about this case would what would we have to change to make you give this patient antibiotics? Uh, she'd have to be sick. Okay, first of all, she'd she'd have to be pretty bad sick, and I. Uh, that could be just a very high white count and still looking pretty good, for example, or uh, a serious uh, malaise, loss of energy and so forth that's endured for more than since she first noticed her urine odor. Mm -hmm. some, some, she has to be sick. I think we just, when somebody says, I'm going to treat you just to be on the safe side, that is such a wicked remark because it's not safe to give antibiotics. It's distinctly harmful. Mm -hmm. And you have to have, you, you ought to have some evidence that what you're doing is going to help the patient enough to, you know, to counterbalance the harm that you are submitting her to. Right. So I think most people, if, if this woman came in with fever, 101, she has dysuria, you, you send a urinalysis, there's pyuria, and it ends up growing E. coli, something like that. I think most people would feel justified in treating that patient for a urinary tract infection because depending on what definition you go by, when somebody has systemic signs and symptoms of and you know and signs of an infection of the urinary tract, I think then you're justicated, you're justified in treating them. Um, the, the case we gave you initially was more just, a lady with, she had pyuria and a change in her odor, and and that patient I would feel comfortable not treating as well. So I wanted to see how you handle. Yes, and and if, Matt, if I may say, if she were sick, you would treat her, and it would have nothing to do with the odor of her urine. If she's no, <laughs> okay. that's true. That's true. Let's move on, and let's say that this this patient is coming in and. Her daughter brings her in and says, "You know what, Tom? For the last for the last month or so, Mom has just not been acting like herself, and her her urine smells weird. Um, you know, the past two days she's been acting really funny. I I think she has a urinary tract infection. How do you talk that family member or that caregiver down and and try to kind of what what do you do in that situation?" Uh, I sigh deeply inwardly because there are some some daughters are I shouldn't single out daughters but they are they're the best caregivers and some of them have seen mom get delirious and get better and have bacteria and then get better after they receive antibiotics and it is not a question any longer as to whether that's cause and effect it is it's happened two or three times in a row and it's happening again now I'm not taking her home until you give me a prescription. Exactly. Yep. I've encountered this many times. Yeah, I think we all have. And and there, there's no easy answer to it. Uh, there's, you know, we'd like to, we're children of the enlightenment and we believe that knowledge should solve these problems, but the lack of benefit and the likelihood of harm, the, the certainty of some harms and the likelihood, the possibility of other severe harms. Then, if it, depending on the uh, medical literacy of the patient, you can. There are guidelines which say that in exactly the case that you're describing, even some and uh, one of them, if there's fever, you you don't need, you shouldn't call that a UTI. You shouldn't send a urine, and you shouldn't treat with antibiotics. But the, I must say, all of these guidelines and, and uh, consensus conferences are in long-term care. Mm -hmm. Now, if a woman is uh, independent at home and driving around at the age of 75 and something, and she is objectively worse for 30 days and now distinctly step another step off two days later, that is very, very serious. And another 
penalty for just pushing the UTI button is that you're missing something else. That that's a very ominous picture that you're painting. Mm-hmm. That she's she's not not at the top of her game for weeks, and these last couple of days she's just not right. There's something bad enough to make me bring her to you. That's not the time to give antibiotics and pat you know and tell tell her to see you. I'll see you later. Right. That 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 interfering with a decent workup for delirium is a penalty when you say, oh, she's got a UTI. Yeah. Yeah. Would you be? Do you think we'd be justified in in sending that patient, the the newly delirious patient, uh, and you and you really don't get, you you really can't tell anything just on a quick office visit. You're sending that person to the emergency department or admitting that patient to try to get a, a further workup. It depends on the the social situation. If there's any chance she's going to not come back or you're going to lose track of her, then I think yes, I would admit her. If she has a f- highly cohesive social fabric and is interested in her health and has somebody who's going to look after her, I think you could start out the first few steps with, uh, as an outpatient, sure. assuming, you know, assuming she's not acutely ill. Yeah. Acutely ill. Right. And uh, yeah, if we suspect sepsis, that patient's going to the hospital, but if, if, if not, you know, you can't really find anything. They're just not behaving quite like themselves. Okay. You can potentially handle that as an outpatient if they have the right social setup. I feel like um, almost the shades of gray happen more often on the inpatient side for me. Like you'll you'll get someone who's say moderately to severely demented, who maybe is just acting a little bit differently. Mom's just not eating as much, and then she had to fall out of bed, so I brought her in. And so you know, the emergency department, who I'm not faulting at all, but sort of sends off the pan labs, and you have this sort of weekly positive urine with a little bit of pyuria and a little bit of bacteria, and, and maybe an acute kidney injury that gets the patient admitted, and then you have this lab just kind of sitting there staring you in the face without a real clear context of what's happening at home. And like I feel like those are the ones where it's where you struggle, you know, is the is the bacteria causative for anything or is it, you know, this a quote UTI or not? I feel like that's those kind of ambiguous cases are particularly challenging. How do you what is your approach for those? They they are challenging, but once again it depends on on the level of the conversation, but you could say, you know, she we just happen to be able to see these few things because they grow on agar. Remember that your mom always has bacteria and lots of them in the in the urinary tract. But if you think she has an occult infection somewhere, the thing, it, once again, the right move is not to start antibiotics. She needs to be cultured up fully. If she's sick enough, start the antibiotics and then stop them. She can be very short courses of antibiotics. But if the cultures are negative, it should be very, very short. And I, I know, and you know, that sometimes the ED drives the, 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 the direction they get started on antibiotics, and two days later, the culture is negative, and nobody stops the antibiotics. Right, and uh, that that's bad medicine. We if the culture if you what if there's no bacteria there, it makes on the cultures, then it makes it harder to justify the antibiotics. I I do think that at least at least in the the version of Cashlack where where I frequent, I I do think that people are starting to get on board with a lot of this. One of the one of the teachings that we got earlier this year from uh, Dr. Bob Centaur was that whenever someone is admitted with pneumonia to his service, he always he always assumes that the, the diagnosis is wrong and then he tries to talk to talk himself into it, you know, that that it could be possible. He's like, can uh-huh. I convince myself that this patient has pneumonia because I think I think they're wrong. Um and I think that that just thinking that way about UTIs as well, and and bilateral cellulitis, which I get a lot, I, I get a lot oh. of that admitted to. And <laughs> welcome uh, to the ignorant. I'm right. sorry, I was doing air quotes. I was doing air quotes with the bilateral cellulitis as well. So I, I think there's a lot of that out there, and it is slowly, slowly this kind of thing. But as you mentioned, it might take ten or twenty years before everyone catches up to you, and you're thinking about the UTI. You know, everyone having a UTI that has a, a you know, a quote unquote positive urinalysis or bacteria. Mm-hmm. I must say, one of my good friends at Hopkins was uh, the director of long term care for a long time, Michelle Bellantoni. And we had something that we called the Bellantoni rule in long term care. If a patient is transferred to you with a diagnosis of pneumonia and a UTI, <laughs> That it, you can be certain that their clinicians had no idea what they were doing, and they just wanted to give antibiotics and send them over to you. Okay. And that and that 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 used to keep us up at night. 
the, the, the you pneumonia and a UTI. So okay, <laughs> what's wrong with this patient? I wonder. Time, time to time to start from zero and and see if you can figure out what's happening. Exactly, exactly, and it, it's you can find, you know, perinephric stranding on most elderly people, and you can find uh, interstitial infiltrates and ground glass opacities in most elderly people, and then there you got it. Pyelonephritis, no less, and a UTI and, and <laughs> pneumonia. Good time to reach right for the fluoroquinolone is what I'm hearing you say. <laughs> yes. And if you start the course, don't stop it either. Right? <laughs> Paul, I'm going to ask you, do you have any further questions? I think we've done a pretty good job covering this topic, and, and I hope we've made it clear. I'm feeling clear on this. I hope the audience feels clear as well. I feel better. I think it's like a lot of things, you know, it's no one's... We talk a lot about preventive medicine, like in a medical legal kind of context. And I feel like that's not even the case a lot of the time. A lot of the time you're doing it because of anecdotal concern that this, you know, potential air quote UTI might pr progress to pyelonephritis. But it sounds like that's not a real common thing. And it's not a real common cause of um, geriatric delirium necessarily. So it's uh, all the things that you kind of worry about. Yeah, I've been sort of reassured about. So I guess it's okay to take the infectious disease approach of just waiting and seeing what declares itself sometimes is what I'm taking away from this. Yes, and I think a, a thing that makes it difficult is what if if I saw that patient in the ED myself and they were a little bit unstable, what I would most like to do, this is the patient who's uh, four weeks of, of slowly deteriorating and then two days of delirium, I would like to culture her fully and admit her and observe her without intravenous anything. And then then the hospital gets after you, right? Right. You can't, that's, that's not enough. Why don't she could be there at home? But she can't because delirium can be the harbinger of something fatal. When you say culture them up, are you including a urine speci specimen there or, is, or are you just sending blood or sputum or whatever stool if they're having diarrhea? I, I, you're, uh, urine as well. And the reason is if, it ma if, the, if there's matching b bugs in the uh, urine and blood, then you have a little way, a, a one arrow pointing in that direction. But the, ob the converse is not true. Most elderly people, and this, this hasn't been extensively studied, but there are several small studies if, uh, who have matching bacteria in urine and blood uh, do not have urinary tract symptoms. It's very unusual. And it's not that the bug is a bad one and the body puts up a fight and loses and, and the, de breaches, the defenses are breached. Something very... Uh, insidious and subtle happens and it somehow breaks through into the bloodstream, maybe, or we actually don't know. But but most patients with bacteremic bacteriuria do not have urinary tract symptoms beforehand. But when you see them, they'll be, they'll be sick. Yes, exactly. They'll, there's something wrong with them. And it can, and even that, some, bacteremia is a funny thing. Sometimes people really don't look bad for a while when they have it. Even even older folks. One, one, I'd like to just add one other paragraph, and that has to do with prosthetic joint infection. If you have, do we have another sixty or one twenty? Oh yeah, seconds? yeah. We're as much time as you need. Yeah, absolutely. We have we are on very cordial terms with surgery, and we sometimes don't agree when there's a, a prosthetic joint going in and a bacteria bacteriuria is discovered. There's a large observation, so it's an observational trial, not an intervention, where some surgeons did uh, get urine cultures before prosthetic joint implantation and others didn't, and in some, some surgeons treated the bacteriuria and others didn't. And it turns out that if you have bacteriuria, the chance that you're going to get a prosthetic joint infection is three or four times higher than if you don't. Hmm. But treating that bacteriuria does not reduce the risk. And at one year, no joint infection in any patient with bacteriuria was the same bug as what was in the bladder. So what w one way of thinking about that is bacteriuria is a sign of frailty or yeah. a vulnerability in some way. It's not going to jump into the joint. You can sterilize the urine and you're still just as likely to get the infection, but it's never that bug. You're just vulnerable. Mm. 
And I think of it, to me, that's sort of a paradigm for delirium. Delirium, you, uh, people with bacteria almost certainly get that delirious more often, but it's a marker of frailty. Both of those occur more commonly in frail older, older people. One of the sources I was reading was mentioning for, for patients with a geriatric syndrome and sort of nonspecific symptoms, you might just bring them into the hospital, hydrate them up, you know, maybe you can adjust their medications if you think a medication's causing it. But, you know, sometimes just doing that and just kind of watching them for a time, like you're suggesting, they, they might come back to normal and you, you've, you've spared them the antibiotics. Well, in a, a couple of sizable studies of hospitalized patients who, uh, in the group who became delirious, it is almost a universal finding that half of them are better in one day. We think, we remember the people who were just bad, bad, bad for a long time and some who may never have recovered, but the majority of uh, ascertained cases of delirium is uh, better in one day. So as, as with delirium getting better, if you give antibiotics to treat the urinary tract, the uh, brief hospitalization and tune-up also benefits from the generally good outcomes that follow the treatment of self-limited illness, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> right. Just tincture of time and some hydration, <laughs> right? Monsieur Voltaire. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is I, I never would, I would never do that if the patient was stable because I consider hospitalization also a terrific risk. Mm-hmm. Right. And really the better thing to do is stop a few medicines. It doesn't matter which. And anything, if there was any recent increase or really decrease in the med list recent, uh, then that, that is a primary point of attack. And then if there's anything that makes you think infection, could just culture the heck out of them and don't give antibiotics. Okay. I like it. Paul, any last questions? No, no. As per usual, I feel like we covered a lot of good ground. Well, Tom, can you give us a couple favorite take-home points that you'd like the audience to remember about this topic? I would say, number one, we're living in the era of the microbiome and the, the harms from antibiotic treatment are even greater than we imagine than we know. They are re- it's hard to imagine that the, the 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 community that you've been carrying around with you for years is tr- is trivial, is non beneficial, is uh, deserves to be bombarded with antibiotics, and the recovery is poor. That's number one. And number two, I think you got at very early is the, it's just the extreme power of the phrase UTI. Everybody knows what it is. Everybody knows it needs antibiotics. And the cl- poor clinician really is, is pushing a big rock up the hill frequently <laughs> in trying to, trying to inter- you know, ad- not give antibiotics. Maybe by the time Paul is a professor emeritus from, uh, from, his, <laughs> from Cashlac, uh, maybe this practice will no longer be so widespread. Well, the earth will be in flames and <laughs> <laughs> yes. it'll just be the cockroaches, but sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I hope you had a good time and uh, maybe we could, maybe we can do another one of your, your topics, pick something else from the medical ignorone to, to go through on, at a, at a future date. I'd love to. Their name is Legion and we got a lot of <laughs> This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. There's the stuff. Get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. We are committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate and review the show on iTunes or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks, as always, to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. And I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And good night. Good night.